In this lecture series, we'll be looking at climate change, which is one of the most important issues our generation and the next few generations will face, indeed, for the near-term future. To start off with, we'll look at climate itself and some of the factors that affect it and how it changes. The book examines a case history up in northern Minnesota and wherein the boreal forests are changing uh, in response to climate and asks the question of what effect and what relationship forest fires in that uh, section of the forest have to the processes that are climate change. And we'll explore some of those through this lecture. To start off with, we need to define climate and distinguishes it, distinguish it from weather. Climate is a long-term pattern or condition, trends, and meteorological conditions. So it's the temperatures that you'll see year after year in the summer being warm in California and relatively cool or wet winters depending on where you are in the state. Weather, on the other hand, are the local conditions and the short-term conditions, meteorological properties of the atmosphere on any given day. What's the temperature today? Is it raining? What's the wind like? That's what we refer to commonly as weather. But it's important to note that the long-term patterns of climate are also typically over broader areas. So we refer to climate in California as having a Mediterranean climate. That's true of much of the state. Uh, coastal areas uh, may show some variation due to the presence of the ocean, but it's that uh, cool, wet winter relatively and that warm, dry, hot summer in the, uh, that we experience year in, year out in California that gives rise to what we describe as our climate. Weather shows daily variation during the summer, uh, maybe less on a day-to-day -day basis, but certainly in the other seasons of the year, uh, you can find a fair bit of variation from one day to the next as storms progress through this off the Pacific Ocean and travel across California. Weather can change also, uh, but typically, and over the uh, geologic past, uh, the pace of change or the rate of change in climate tends to be much, much slower and more gradual, and is usually reflected in long-term averages. Climate change, which is an issue we're concerned with here, is defined as an alteration in these long-term patterns of uh, meteorological conditions and also the statistical averages of meteorological events. This would be average temperatures of the, at the surface of the Earth would be an example. So what are some of the factors that can affect climate and induce or change the pace of climate change? One way to think of these as a general category of change is what's referred to as a radiative forcer. And this is a factor or process or condition that can alter the balance of incoming solar radiation relative to the amount of heat that escapes back out into space. So the sun provides the solar input through electromagnetic radiation that travels across space and reaches the Earth. Some of that energy is reflected off the outer atmosphere, but a certain portion passes through the atmosphere and reaches the ground surface and affects the energy and heat balance of the Earth. A certain amount of that energy then will be released from the atmosphere and escape back out into space. So a radiative forcer then will change the balance of inputs and outputs of energy to and from the Earth. Recall that earlier we said that the Earth is energetically open to space, whereas it's closed to matter and materials. There are many different radiative forcers, and they can have either a heating or a cooling effect. Some of the major ones are the greenhouse effect, the albedo effect, clouds, changes in solar irradiance, which is the output from the sun, volcanic eruptions, and Milankovitch cycles, which have to do with the rotation and orbit of the Earth. 
And again, it's important to note that many of these factors can have both e either a cooling effect and some have a warming effect on the planet. The greenhouse effect, based on greenhouse gases that we referred to earlier, and you probably have heard of somewhere along the way, greenhouse effect is one type of radiative forcer that will promote warming. The natural greenhouse effect is responsible for maintaining a comfortable uh, average set of surface temperatures at the Earth. The Earth would be a very, very uh, frigid Arctic type of place throughout the whole globe were it not for the ability of the atmosphere to trap and re-radiate some of the incoming radiation that hits the Earth and is reflected back into space. It would be reflected back into space, but instead is trapped by some significant greenhouse gases that are naturally occurring. Water vapor and carbon dioxide are two of the major greenhouse gases that occur naturally in the atmosphere. And it's CO2, the carbon dioxide, that's changed with the uh, increasing use of fossil fuels and has served to enhance the greenhouse effect, uh, which is, a, again, taking a normal phenomena and making it stronger. So as the greenhouse gases increase in the atmosphere, largely due to increased CO2, uh, the heat trapping and re-radiation within the atmosphere has become much more pronounced, and that effect has warmed the planet even more than normal. So again, to recall that the, the, function, or the function and role of carbon dioxide is tied very closely to the carbon cycle, which we talked about earlier. Naturally occurring or enhanced CO2 in the atmosphere is taken up by plants, cycled through soil or through uh, plant and animal uh, trophic relationships, and then cellular respiration from either plants or animals will return CO2 back to the atmosphere. And again, this is typically in something of a balance and maintaining a certain very small percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere. And typically those uh, change um, over, a, over a much slower process over geologic time, as you'll see in the uh, video assigned for this section on crude oil. It has a very good um, summary of, of historic and geologic time situations where there have been rapid increases relatively in greenhouse gases and changes in the greenhouse effect. But again, those, even though rapid, relatively speaking, are much slower than what we're currently experiencing. Another major factor that can change and is changing right now, the albedo effect, and that can be a radiative force or either to a a warming or a cooling trend. The reflectivity of the surface is what constitutes the albedo. So if you can imagine a, a relatively white surface like snow and ice, you'll have a high degree of reflective energy coming off of the surface. Some will be trapped in the atmosphere and returned back, but a, a large portion is reflected away. Contrast that with the darker co colors of, say, the open ocean, and you'll find that the ocean absorbs more radiation and reflects a much smaller amount. Thus, the snow and ice is deemed as having the larger albedo and a much higher degree of surface reflectivity. So a, a high albedo surface will have, can have a cooling effect, whereas a darker al or lower albedo or a darker surface can have a warming effect. And so if you can imagine what the consequences are of melting ice caps both at the North and South Poles, you're going from lighter colored surfaces and higher albedo to darker surfaces and increasing the heat trapping and re-radiation at the colder ends of the Earth. Clouds like albedo can be either a warming or cooling radiative forcer. It has to do with the type of cloud. When clouds are of a certain type, they tend to have a high albedo and then reflect energy coming in from the sun and will serve to shade and, and 
by reflecting incoming solar radiation, they'll cool the planet. Other types of clouds, and these are typically the very high, wispy, cirrus type clouds, can trap that uh, heat coming up from the surface and re-radiate it and function much as a greenhouse gas. And thus, they, that type of cloud typically is considered uh, a, having a warming effect and being a positive or warming radiative forcer. There are a variety of other natural forcers. Um, there are um, volcanic eruptions, which tend to throw ash and other uh, con gas constituents in the atmosphere. On whole, those can tend to be cooling uh, forcers. The sun itself can undergo uh, changes in output, uh, and this modifies the solar irradiance experienced from the Earth. If this is um, increased output, that will tend to warm the Earth. If the sunspot activity is greater, then you'll have um, changes in the cycle as well. And there's a great deal of flux and change on the sun, but the rate at which it changes tends to cycle over a 10 to 11 year period and has not uh, increased steadily over the least the last few decades. But it's important to note that these type of natural forcers are going to affect climate uh, and do, uh, but they're relatively short time frame and fairly episodic. We tend to have large volcanic eruptions only uh, infrequently. Every decade or every 20 years or so will a volcano that's large enough to affect global climate take place. And finally, the Milankovitch cycles uh, play a role in the climate and climate change although they happen over much longer time periods. And this is tens of thousands of years. This happens when the Earth's orbit, which is uh, not completely stable, uh, changes slightly from either a circular orbit to a, a more of an elliptical pattern, and the axial tilt will change by several degrees, and that will influence the type of surface, whether it be more ocean or more land surface, uh, is exposed to the sun and will, and will change the um, heat loading of the earth and be a factor in affecting whether the earth, earth is warming or cooling. But again, this is happening um, on a much longer time scale than we are seeing with recent uh, global warming and climate change. So when you account for the warming forcers and the cooling forcers, either with, that we refer to as either positive or negative forcers, the net balance right now is a net radiative increase in temperature but due to net warming when you take into account uh, in, drastic increases in CO2, methane, uh, and other constituents. You'll note on this chart, bar chart, that as tropospheric ozone is actually a warming material because it will indeed act as a greenhouse gas, but there's been a decrease in the, uh, in the stratospheric ozone allowing more energy in and helping warm the system. Uh, solar ir irradiance is regular, uh, small uh, situations where increased combustion of materials uh, creates fine uh, particles of black soot on snow and this can help melt ice and increase the surface that's of a darker color and a lower albedo. So again, when you consider all the factors globally that are changing, the trend is to increase the warming forcers and contribute to warmer climates. This concludes the first part of the lecture. Please continue on with the second part. In this section, we'll focus on what are some of the factors that are causing the current situation where we have a net increase in warming forcers that's contributing to global warming. Chief among them is the fact that the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have increased substantially over the last century and a half from about 280 parts per million to about 390 as of 2011. And this can be compared and, uh, and 
collaborate or corroborated by um, ice core data and by measurements of both the gas in the atmosphere. It's important to do both from the standpoint of being able to reconstruct the carbon dioxide levels in the historic um, atmospheres using data uh, that can go back anywhere from centuries to hundreds of thousands of years by drilling in places like Antarctica or in Greenland on the large ice sheets. It was the rather, it was very groundbreaking work going back into the late 50s and early 60s to where scientists at the Mauna Loa Observatory started measuring atmospheric CO2 levels. Uh, it's referred to as the Keeling Curve for the scientists that led this work. And what they found is, is that with seasonal variations from summer to winter, where you have more plant activity uh, and or less activity with the colder and wetter times of the year and lower sunlights, the overall trend was progressively increasing CO2 levels to levels that haven't been seen for a long period of time in Earth's history. What's also important to note is that the, based on the ice core data, it's been observed that the rate of change in CO2 has been very, very rapid compared to earlier levels of increase. And this is tied uh, or compared with levels dating back prior, prior to the, the advent of the main industrial revolution. But it's not just CO2 uh, coming off of um, industrial process that increases, increasing but there are other significant CO2 gases or greenhouse gases that are increasing as well. The methane, uh, which has, is able to trap pound for pound uh, many times the amount of heat that uh, carbon dioxide did, up to 25, um, is very important. And the amount of methane production has been increasing substantially with uh, the increased herding of cattle primarily, uh, who in their waste emit large quantities of methane to the point where this is, although much smaller in quantity than CO2 emissions, has an, uh, an important contribution to overall greenhouse, uh, en enhancement of the greenhouse effect by gas emissions. Nitrous oxide through uh, combustion of fossil fuels is likewise increased. And then things like halocarbons, the chlorofluorocarbons that we talked about during the uh, earliest chapters or in the earliest lectures were uh, released through industrial and uh, refrigerant type materials. Those are even more, uh, uh, even stronger greenhouse gases. But even though their quantity is much smaller, they still add to the mix of increasing greenhouse gases that we've released over the last 100 150 years. So with the warming that we've talked about due to the radiative forcers, this can set up what's referred to as positive feedback loops. This comes out of systems theory, and you've probably heard of feedback uh, and perhaps feedback loops uh, elsewhere. But the cycle runs like this. As the temperature rises, more ice is melted and that creates a darker or an enhanced darker surface of the earth with reduced uh, reflective ice. That uh, darkening, darkening of the surface uh, absorbs more heat and re-radiates more heat back in the atmosphere. That raises the temperature further which melts more ice and so on. So this is a, a positive loop and feedback loop that continually will increase the variable under consideration in this in this case atmospheric temperature. So again a positive feedback as a general concept is something that changes caused by an initial event that then further accentuate that original event. So warming begets warming. But it's interesting that the warming can also trigger negative feedback loops, and these work the create the opposite um, trend. That albedo effect we talked about, the reflective aspect of clouds. So if the warming temperature increased the formation of more high albedo clouds, 
that could trigger a cooling event and indeed uh, cause a negative feedback loop. Because remember that if you uh, have clouds that are large and thick um, bodies with uh, white surfaces, they're going to tend to re reflect much more uh, heat than they absorb. And so the negative feedback in this case would be changes that are caused by the initial event that trigger events which then reverse the initial response. So from a standpoint of clouds, what do you think could change and increase the quantity of clouds and increase the cooling effect of clouds? So we'll come back to that. The short-term event is that we've had um, various factors that go on on the surface. Uh, re currently, you're seeing that the CO2 released from permafrost that's melting in the Arctic regions is leading to increased growth of local vegetation. That can tend to trap more uh, CO2 uh, within the plant tissue and in the roots. But unfortunately, in the longer term, that thaw is increasing the loading of CO2 because there's more being released than can be taken up by vegetation. Simply the energy levels within the um, or incoming solar radiation as energy to drive plant growth is very limited in the polar regions. So what are the consequences of this warming? According to NOAA, the average global land surface temperature is increased by just under 1 degree C or about 1.73 degrees Fahrenheit in 2010 compared to the long term the 20th century average for the, over the last 100 years. Sea surface temperatures have also increased and in some cases is by as much as 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's significant from the standpoint of enhancing or expanding melting ice in the Arctic regions. So we have definitely, we are, we are, we're detecting and measuring uh, significant changes in temperature. These may seem small, but from the standpoint of changing the ice packs and further enhancing the uh, surf changes in the surface, these are very important uh, changes over time. So why does it matter? Well, what will happen is, when you, if you think of the normal climate, in, um, uh, say over a longer time period, there's going to be some rare events. You're going to have hot periods and cold periods, um, extreme what we consider maybe extreme weather. And those will occur on any given uh, time frame, uh, looking at the, av the average temperatures versus the um, extreme cold or extreme hot events. What happens with a shift is that if you increase the temperature, you'll increase the amount of warming and the amount of um, former hot extreme weather will become more prevalent over time as that curve is expanded to the right. And you'll have less cold weather, which will have some positive events. You'll have less frost damage of crops, perhaps, uh, less ice storms, less, maybe uh, less damage associated with that. But you will have heat-related problems as well. And in areas that are warmer or hotter climates, you'll have things like increased demand for air conditioning, increased electrical demand during peak periods. So there are going to be a wide variety of effects of this shift as temperature goes to a warmer norm. So we've, I've made the statement that there, um, there have been observations and data presented um, that suggest that the climate has been warming. Let's take a look at some of this evidence. Temperatures have been measured uh, throughout the globe, and those have been plotted over the map of the land surfaces and the ocean surfaces. And what they find is, is that the, uh, there are significant areas where the average temperatures are warmer than the long term, or the, the temperatures are warmer than the long term average, and are becoming warmer overall. Now the uh, most recent decade, few decades, and in fact the last decade, um, have been some of the warmest on record. And that August 2002, or August 2011, 
was the second warmest August behind 1998, dating all the way back to 1880. And so this is part of a series of consecutive months where global uh, temperature, surface temperatures, have been above the long-term average. So we're seeing this at many places throughout the globe, not just at isolated weather stations or continental locations. And when you look at the long-term trend of average temperatures, um, allowing for differences in measurement and, uh, say, air, potential errors in the measurement, there is still a gradual but steady trend of increasing temperatures. That over the long term, the temperature tends to be warming. Isolated incidents uh, can cause the temperature to dip, but ultimately the uh, trend has been towards warming, and especially over the period of this last century. What we see is periods uh, where um, the temperatures have risen and fallen, but the, um, the trend is continuous. Some of the other effects that go with it and things that have been measured is that the, there has been a, a steady cumulative loss of glacier mass across the planet. Uh, the mean loss of ice across all glaciers is plotted on the left and it shows that there's been a steady and significant decline in the amount of ice on the Earth's surface. Likewise, on the right, there has uh, been uh, evidence for rising sea level. The, the height of sea level rise is still relatively small over the, this time frame of maybe six inches or so, but in low-lying coastal areas under storm conditions, this will gradually become catastrophic where uh, storms that did not uh, cause inland flooding will with greater frequency. With regard to the glacier mass loss, uh, if you want to see the glaciers at Glacier National Park, you need to go soon because the glacial retreat there is such that many of the larger, more spectacular ice masses that gave the park its name have lost over half of their ice mass and it's predicted that within the next few decades there will be very few and relatively small glaciers left there. One of the questions is, since we know that climates change naturally in the long before humans came on the scene, it's important to understand whether or not we're seeing a natural trend or to what extent a human influence. One of the main tools, because of the complexity of the climate across the planet, has been the use of major uh, climate models. And these can examine the effect of different factors and uh, their relative influence or, or the extent to which they control changes in climate. If you look at the graph on the left and consider only natural causes, the, the blue line is showing the observed temperatures and the purple over the uh, purple shading over the purple line is what the computer models predict would have occurred uh, if there were just natural uh, forces chain, or affecting the weather. When you consider both on the right, both natural and anthropogenic changes like greenhouse gas emissions um, and the uh, through either combustion or increased animal um, production and things like that, you get fairly good agreement between the model's prediction of what the climate would be doing and what it's actually done. Modeling is a very powerful tool. It has to be done carefully, though, because of the complexity of the systems you're measuring and the, um, based on the amount of data we have. But it is ultimately uh, strongly supported by multiple models, and that's what is noted here, is that you have um, multiple uh, climate models representing these predicted uh, or observed versus uh, predicted changes in climate temperature. So one of the questions is uh, whether or not we can rely on these climate models to give us this, this, these sort of predictions and this sort of um, analysis um, as being accurate. One of the questions is whether they can reflect previous um, uh, conditions on the earth and they've been shown to be fairly 
uh, accurate in being able to reconstruct past, uh, past temperatures. Another for source of evidence of uh, change in climate has been, the, as we noted earlier, the um, concentration of CO2 stored in ice as detected there. And what we find is, that, again, there have been changes in uh, the CO2 stored in the ice based on how much is in the atmosphere, and that corresponds to reconstruct the temperatures going back and we find fairly good agreement between the two. What we find is that the temperature is rising very rapidly now and that shows signs of rising even more rapidly in the future. So this, the ice core data is a very powerful tool to look backward in time and compare more distant changes of CO2 and temperature with the current conditions. It's important, as in the case of the uh, study of the disappearing ozone layer, to use the scientific method and all the tools that scientists have available to them to make uh, accurate observations and predictions and interpretation of current and future conditions. So when you have observational studies, because you can't really manipulate the earth and the climate, you'll be, we can look at the ice core data and tree rings, sediment cores, and the growth of coral reefs layers to look at the relationship between temperature and CO2 in the atmosphere. And all of these studies to date have shown that the CO2 levels and temperatures have been closely aligned over this uh, recent geologic past, or about the last 400,000 years. In order to experiment with climate, it's done through computer modeling and simulation and they find that the, regardless of the cause of increased CO2, um, the temperature change and is going to be directly related to CO2 change. So as CO2 levels, carbon dioxide levels go up in the atmosphere, so too does temperature. Plus the fact that from a purely from a chemistry point of view uh, and a physics point of view, uh, the reality is, and the, uh, the, the chemical theory is very well established, that these greenhouse gases do indeed trap and re-radiate heat. So the relationship between CO2 and temperature is, is one of both cause and effect. It's really important with these complex decisions that affect both uh, public policy, uh, major changes in industry and agriculture that the scientists get this right and they make every effort to as they do in the process of science to gain uh, critical review through replicated studies again with multiple computer models uh, in, constructed and developed tested independently and with peer review by multiple scientists and the vast majority of scientists have reviewed climate science tend to agree with the larger findings of the uh, relationship between CO2 and temperature and the influence of human activities on global warming. One of the major bodies, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is an international group uh, that's been convened over the last decade or so to evaluate uh, past and current and future climate science and to make sure that it undergoes rigorous peer review and be able to explain it to policymakers and politicians with regard to the implications for continuing to produce more CO2 in the atmosphere with the effects that can be predicted from uh, models and observations. This completes the second part of the lecture and the third we'll look at what the future may hold. In this third and final section, we'll look at climate change as it is predicted to affect our future prospects and conditions on Earth. So what are some of the current and likely consequences that we'll see in the future, especially in the near term, with additional climate change and global warming? Some of the major ones that have been predicted are extreme weather, that we'll have more variability, uh, that we'll see greater storms, more extensive droughts, uh, ice storms and such, 
And that's already been noted that in many places that there are more frequent extreme events. When you think about uh, hurricanes forming in the Atlantic, coming in and affecting the eastern and southeastern coasts, they're closely tied to the ocean surface temperatures. So if the ocean, if the air, the atmosphere warms, the ocean surface will warm, and storms that were tropical depressions will become uh, tropical storms. Tropical storms will increase their magnitude to hurricanes, and small hurricanes will become very large ones. And this is directly tied to increases in temperature on the surface. And we'll see more, it's predicted that we'll see more extreme um, swings of precipitation. Greater drought, but in, in some cases, uh, greater precipitation and a shift in precipitation. So there are a variety of weather changes that are anticipated that are fairly readily predicted by increasing temperatures in the atmosphere. Likewise, there will be a variety of impacts on species and ecosystems in response to climate change. And those are summarized in your book. As temperatures warm, um, some species will shift their range and attempt to go to higher altitudes uh, by growing at higher altitudes than they current do. Plants are already, uh, flowering plants are already observed in many cases to be flowering earlier. Some of the uh, communities that are affected, birds and such, their migration patterns are being changed with changing flowering periods and uh, increasing temperatures, decreases in ice. And then what's interesting is, and the, 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 one of the big questions is, can species grow further north, uh, attempting to find cooler temperatures, if the temperature increases in the lower latitudes continues to increase? because the spread of plants is a very slow process and the uh, propagation of, from one to another. In many cases, um, plant communities will run to human uh, habitation, human ecosystems, roads, uh, farms, developed areas, and so their ability to migrate north is liable to be largely curtailed. So we're seeing a variety of different um, effects on this, not the least of which could be uh, warmer temperatures leading to uh, increased growth of pests that can destroy trees, um, causing uh, forest mortality. Those trees can then be more susceptible to fires and catastrophic fires, and that too can add more CO2 to the atmosphere and further enhance the greenhouse effect. So to go back to our one of our opening uh, cases of the Minnesota forests, the forests there uh, have a combination of conifers, spruce, pine species, uh, maple, and oak. Um, the extent to which they can survive warming climates is an open question. And to what extent will the human communities that depend on these forests be affected? One of the things that, like I say, we're currently starting to see are forest species starting to move effectively by propagating further north on the edges of the range. But unfortunately, that may be not a viable uh, means of survival because if the deer population is high in those areas, for example, they will eat the uh, new growth and the early migrators uh, will be consumed before they can ever properly establish and even begin to start to mature. And as I noted, when you'll see not only changes in temperature, but you'll see uh, less snowpack and earlier melts. Uh, you may see summer water shortages, and those will affect the growing season of the plants and the trees trying to migrate north. And this, the stresses of water and temperature are liable to combine with increased uh, pest populations to create much greater uh, beetle infestations and lead to more uh, catastrophic fires. The communities that depend on these forests are likewise predicted to be um, adversely affected. If the um, forest system there changes substantially and moves to the north, uh, a great deal of tourism uh, is anticipated to move out of the area, either disappear entirely or uh, shift to other communities. 
uh, there will be a considerable loss of jobs in areas that are already rural with uh, relatively few good paying jobs. Logging and forest um, production is going to be uh, curtailed in, the least in some areas and shifted and that likewise will affect um, the local economic well-being of communities. So there are some fairly serious economic effects with migration of forests due to climate change and global warming. Coupled with these are other ecological effects, um, or they're the based for, these changes are based on the ecological effects um, that the values and the ecosystem services we just considered in earlier lectures may be changed as well. Whereas if the forests change and are lost, their ability to stabilize soil and uh, clean water and provide uh, good water supplies may be diminished. And so our ecosystem services may be lost and the values we uh, gain from them at low or no cost may have to be purchased in the future. With these changes, uh, other areas are anticipated to undergo some, um, some positive benefits. It's anticipated that in uh, ice-covered places like Greenland, uh, or at least around the margins of the ice sheet, you'll see warmer temperatures uh, extending the growing season and allow for greater agricultural production, at least for local communities. We've already noted that the Northwest Passage and shipping routes through the Arctic Ocean has been opened and this can reduce shipping times and uh, energy costs associated with that shipping as well. Canada is likely to benefit as they become warmer and more habitable. Uh, there will be fewer cold related problems, less maintenance costs for roads perhaps and things like that and um, perhaps greater maple syrup production, um, increased in the number of freeze-thaw cycles, and other benefits that um, both from a commodities production and an infrastructure system may benefit uh, economically. But these will be traded off against potentially um, economic downsides as well. So the question then comes, and this has to do with the larger questions of sustainability we face in a society. How do we address and respond to the problems associated with climate change? One major uh, policy approach is mitigation. And that's uh, actually, it's kind of after the fact prevention, where you type, try to minimize the extent or the impact of climate change. That would uh, include things like trying to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions currently, um, command and control regulations where we try to regulate industries or practices that have uh, impacts on and, and contribute to radiative uh, forcers, cap and trade, allow industries to um, economically or to through financial reasons uh, resources uh, manage their ability to produce um, greenhouse gases offset by reductions through other uh, other partners and other places. Um, incentives are one thing, carbon taxes are another to try to uh, to create a, uh, negative incentives if you will for industry to find uh, alternative practices that reduce their greenhouse emissions, much the same as the carpet company did by changing how it operated, both in manufacture and recycling. One technological approach that a lot of people uh, would like to see be the answer or a major part of the answer, and that's practices to sequester carbon and store it in various uh, situations and live with the carbon that we're producing by trapping it or, or uh, restricting its uh, presence in the, in the atmosphere. Resistance forestry to grow more trees and try and incorporate more CO2 into the growth of trees that will store carbon in its tissues and its roots for a longer period of time. This is an important area in the future because it's part of the precautionary principle and that 
while we don't know exactly what the future holds, we have some pretty good ideas now of what the consequences of global warming and increased greenhouse gas emissions are going to be. So action now, while it can't stop the greenhouse gas uh, buildup in the atmosphere we've currently experienced, it can limit its uh, increase and limit the damages it brings in the future by current actions. There are a variety of practices that have been proposed and some of these are really involving some rather significant changes in the way we uh, operate as a society. And uh, Pakala and Sokolau uh, proposed what they call stabilization wedges uh, that they estimate each of which could reduce the reduce um, CO2 emissions by uh, one gigaton or a billion tons per year and thereby at least stabilize uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the current levels until such time as it can go down. And they, some of these practices include, as we mentioned, capturing carbon that's in the atmosphere and sequestering it through um, various types of products and uh, plantings. Um, a rapid increase in energy efficiency, both in, mainly in automotive sector, to reduce the uh, fuel consumption we currently have, um, dramatic increase in sustainable energy such as windmills or solar. They project that even an expansion of nuclear um, could be a significant one because nuclear does not produce uh, significant greenhouse gas emissions other than maybe during the construction phase provided there are no accidents. Waste management. Um, because landfills produce methane gas if not properly managed, um, forestry, agriculture, there are a variety of different practices that can have significant, globally significant impacts on the amount of carbon released and stored in the atmosphere. It's interesting to note that while many of these are going to be expensive, there are job creation opportunities throughout these. Uh, virtually every change in regulations that is increased and, and mandated uh, air pollution controls has involved new technology, new retrofits, and increased ha, has had a net increase in the number of jobs produced. So there are econo economic uh, opportunities uh, that come with these significant efforts to try to stabilize carbon dioxide levels that are currently in the atmosphere. At the policy level, there's the, uh, a major effort from 1997 was the Kyoto Protocol where international um, negotiations took place and there were a set of protocols and practices to try and achieve certain targets of CO2 release to reduce them uh, for various nations. The U.S. notably is the, is the largest per capita producer of greenhouse gas emissions has refused to sign it and objected because of the uh, perceived unfairness of it the, um, and the, the fact that they didn't, the policymakers at the time and since have argued that um, they don't want to give up eco perceived economic benefits in the face of protecting um, the climate from um, changes in the future um, by virtue of uh, change, have, requiring changes uh, in industry. And they're, again, large money interests. They're very opposed to change that affect uh, carbon loading of the atmosphere. There's, uh, there was significant debate on the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, some countries um, saying that they, this is going too far and that um, it would hurt the economy and companies much in the international level as well as in the United States. Um, the, some argue, though, that um, there were benefits to be had that forced forcing people to go and countries to go to new standards and new practices would open up uh, job markets and open up economic opportunities as well. And again, there were those critics more in the environmental community that said that we don't have time um, without um, and need to move without delay to go beyond what was agreed to in the Kyoto. So at best, the Kyoto was a starting point of international policy, but is yet to make uh, significant inroads in changing it. It's likely that the private sector and personal uh, 
motion will, or personal activities and changes uh, will have a more lasting effect in the future. Climate change in the context of the, this textbook we're using uh, language is a wicked problem. Um, it's difficult. It's viewed as being one where it's pervasive. The effects of change uh, to address carbon loading of the atmosphere are pervasive throughout industry, throughout our energy system, our transportation, our daily lives, and that that change will cost. It may cost consumers more um, to fill up their tanks or to purchase things uh, if you pay the full cost of things with regard to um, uh, industries or uh, consumer products or transportation choices that increase carbon loading. And there are a variety of personal attitudes towards this problem in terms of what to do about it, as noted in the um, earlier lectures. And ultimately, it will boil down to largely a personal choice of what you choose to do and the things you choose to purchase and how you choose to, to live your life um, will have major implications on your energy footprint and your carbon footprint on the Earth. So the impacts that we have are probably tied to the level of action we take in the very near term. Um, if we slow down um, our production of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, we can reduce the rate of um, change and increase in CO2 concentrations and start to slow potentially the effects um, on climate and related resources. If we introduce new technologies um, and so on, and the effects of these literally set up as various scenarios. So there are predictions of what will happen in the future based on the collective choices that are made across the globe as far as um, consumer choices, resource consumption, and CO2 output. Beyond mitigation, which is trying to slow the problem or um, halt the, the worsening of the problems associated with greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, for sure we're going to have to adapt because the warming that is occurring and will occur is largely, some warming is inescapable and some adverse impacts are, uh, cannot be avoided, at least in the near term. These include things like health impacts, whereas if you have increased temperature in some areas, you may increase um, not only uh, pest populations that can damage forests, but also disease-carrying um, insects, um, malaria, um, West Nile virus, things like this that are uh, troublesome, uh, can cause uh, ill health and death in some cases, uh, may expand with uh, warming conditions. And so being able to adapt through our health system to be able to deal with those is going to be necessary. Certainly as sea levels rise and coastal flooding occurs, especially during high water events like storms, coastal erosion and flooding is going to require infrastructure changes and modification. And the state of Florida doesn't like to hear about climate change and sea level rise because if by the end of the century, under some predictions, much of coastal Florida could be under uh, normal sea level, let alone under storm conditions. We will lose species, and in some cases species will probably revert back to, if not sanctuaries, into zoos um, against the day when future, uh, future conditions might change and allow a return to the wild. Polar bears especially are at risk because of loss of the Arctic um, ice cap um, and sea ice. Uh, for prolonged periods of time. Crop productivity will change. It'll increase in some areas with increased uh, warmer climates and perhaps more precipitation, but in other areas drought will become more frequent and deeper, and uh, uh, erosion due to wind and such may cause additional uh, crop losses. So crop productivity is a serious concern in our, in our efforts to try and feed a growing population. And again, tied to many of these is the uh, prospect of increased drought, which will affect water supplies, not only the food, but just the availability of water in arid areas. And then finally, 
fire risk. There's, as things get warmer and places are drier, um, under extreme conditions of drought, much more likely to have catastrophic fire, which will have implications for not only the ecosystems, but air quality, um, further CO2 load, loading through the fires themselves. So we face a wide variety and extensive number of challenges with the, with the current conditions and immediate near-term conditions, even if we uh, were to take uh, many of those extreme stabilization wedge practices immediately, there's going to be some lag time between the, uh, our current situation to where we can actually turn things around to where additional CO2 levels will rise and many of these impacts will become more um, common and more costly to us. The choices we make though individually are what can drive in many cases the solution. This concludes the third part of the lecture. You should move on to the quiz now.